Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to all of you, wherever you're joining us from the world, from, you know, from around the world. Um, my name is Tony Showala. My pronouns are she and her. I am the operations lead for RSA US. Uh, also joining us today is my fantastic colleague, Claire Byrne, who's our community, man our senior community manager here at RSA US. Um, if you need anything throughout this call um, and this conversation, please reach out to us via the chat. Happy to help you. On behalf of Pale Blue, all of our speakers and RSA US, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us for this month's US Salon, Justice in Bloom, Repairing and Restoring from the Root. Before we get started, um, we'd like to give a little bit of background on the RSA, RSA US, and then go through some best practices and ground rules um, for creating the space um, for everyone today. So founded in the UK, we are the Royal Society for Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce and have been uniting people and ideas to resolve the challenges of our time since 1754. Today, the society exists as an international fellowship driven social change organization. We are committed to a world that is resilient, rebalanced and regenerative where everyone can fulfill their potential. Our proven change process, rigorous research, innovative ideas platforms, and unique global network of more than 31,000 change makers work collectively to enable people, places, and the planet to flourish. Of the 31,000 fellows spread out around the globe, about 1,200 live and work here in the United States, including Elizabeth and Kevin, who are joining us today. RSA US exists to coordinate fellowship activities in the United States with an aim towards moving the needle on addressing the inequities of our society. So with that, let's talk a little bit about how we show up and how we support each other in this space. Um, so this event is being recorded. Um, if for any reason you want to adjust the name that shows up, feel free to do that now. Um, we also always aspire to these best practices to hold and create safe spaces for folks. Um, so some of the norms that we hold, um, in addition to allowing animals to be present, um, is to use language that celebrates people's humanity. Um, so speaking from your own perspective and being intentional and aware of the terms and the language and the ways that we're showing up to support and take care of one another. Creating space for all voices. Um, so this may mean you stepping back, it may mean you stretching yourself, um, but we really love to hear um, and want to create um, spaces where all of you feel comfortable to be heard and to share your experiences and journeys. Considering your impact, um, there is a difference between the intention in the things that we say and the impact that it creates. So making sure that we're doing whatever we can to be intentional and aware of the impact that we're creating. And then connecting with each other in authentic ways. Um, this is a, a space where we want to, to see and hear from you. Um, and we're excited to be able to do that. If you do have any questions throughout the event, please let us know. You can send a message um, to either myself or Claire. Um, I'm at RSA US events, um, and then Claire is Claire Byrne. We'll be happy to help. Now, as I share a little bit more about the logistics of today's events, um, I'm going to put our amazing speakers on the screen so you can get a little bit acclimated um, with all of them. As far as logistics, um, Please add questions, comments, resources, and anything else that you want to contribute to today's event to the chat. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout. There will be opportunity um, later in the event to come off mute and engage if you'd like to do that. And if you need, again, any support, um, questions, things like that, please reach out to either Claire or myself via the chat, and we'll be happy to help you. So without further ado, um, I'm very honored um, to introduce um, two amazing fellows, um, Elizabeth Wendell and Kevin Campbell, um, who will be moderating today's conversation. So take it away. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, just welcome everyone and thank you to the RSA for giving us the opportunity to be together today and have an important conversation. Um, I, um, I think I want to start by asking Liz, maybe Liz, you could, um, I know people could read about you, but if maybe you want to say something about who you are briefly, um, just introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth or Liz is fine. And I think the thing that I'm 
I'm called to say is I'm a social worker. Kevin sometimes asks me, do you do social work or are you a social worker? Um, so I'm a social worker. And that's uh, one of the greatest gifts and learnings of my life thus far. And I'm sure as we go, and I'm glad to be with you all today. Thanks, yeah. Kevin. Yeah, so at Pale Blue, Liz is the social worker in the organization. Um, my name is Kevin Campbell. Elizabeth and I work together at Pale Blue Dot. We, um, Pale Blue Dot is, is a construct we've made around work we do globally. Um, and um, it's, it's a place where we created a home for a number of different works we do, um, work we have done um, involving particular work I, I started and Liz and I joined around, which was some work that people started calling family finding. And very specifically what that was, was a research project I started at the beginning of, of this century. Um, and it was to um, in response to something that I learned about as a foster parent. And I learned about working in the child welfare system in the United States. And that was, I kept hearing uh, something said about older about I was working with older teenagers and the thing that everyone started their story with to me as a foster parent or in that role is this kid's got nobody and they believed it and we built an institution around this group of human beings who are children who are said to have nobody and I wondered if it were true that somehow there was something different about these young people I grew up in a family by the way I had um my my dad had 12 siblings. My mom had 11. We, I had 78 um, cousins. Um, and um, so we had a big family. I knew them all. So it was very weird to me to imagine people with no one. And I constructed three research questions. Is it really true these kids have nobody? Um, the second one had to do with the workforce. So workforce that I knew and understood um, struggled. Um, we, we would often hear people say that they you know, they struggled to do the work they came here to do, and therefore they didn't have time. I don't have time is a constant claim. Um, and then the third th uh, part of that, that thinking about the research was, um, you know, if it's not true they have no one, then there's another sort of implicit question that seems to be at work here that justifies it, and that is, if in fact they had parents or if they had relatives, if they had kin, if they had a tribe, um, would these people care and would they be safe? Would they come forward? And we con I constructed research questions. We ultimately spent, I spent a decade traveling the United States. We looked at 50,000 young people across the States and also in, in British Columbia, in Canada. And um, what we found, uh, or what the researchers reported, we had a lot of independent research done, was for 94% of those young people, not only did they did they have a family? Their families were large and complicated, like our family. Um, and the people um, for, and in a number of instances, these young people um, had relatives that didn't even know they existed because there was another thing said about a lot of these kids, they didn't have fathers. And so if you walked around or if you were a person, an adult interacting with a young person and said they didn't have a dad, well, you know, if you don't acknowledge that they have a dad, you're never going to know about their paternal grandmother or grandfathers. You're never going to know about about uncles and aunties and cousins um, and siblings. They might not know. And so we met many, many family members who didn't even know these children existed. Um, and the long and the short of it is that for 94 percent of these kids, um, five to eight adults who were said not to exist came forward and said they wanted a relationship for a lifetime with them even if they were in prison by this point even if they were locked in a psychiatric hospital they they came running they literally came running flying driving asking the church to buy them an airplane ticket so grandma could get there um and um the result of that work got some attention and it ended up in the congress of the united states and um we uh, not through my work particularly, um, and um, we ended up with a, a mandate in the United States that at least what should happen when the government encountered children that it believed were somehow endangered by their family's situation was at least what should happen is an effort should be made to identify who their parents are, who their relatives are, and and um, provide them a timely and 
uh, formal written notice that these children were in the custody of the government and some information about how they could come forward and claim those kids. And my research um, was began in that place. But but the work of Pale Blue has moved beyond that. We um, and it really fits well with what we want to do today, which is um, is begin a conversation with you. Um, and, and I think that one sets the stage for it, which is a conversation that doesn't um, spend time in a way we often spend time, which is which is in their ability to articulate a criticism of the institutions we have, because there's plenty of room to be done, plenty of work to be done there, plenty of opportunity. But it's a conversation we don't feel like we have enough, which is if we if we didn't have these institutions or if we chose not to continue them, what would you build instead? What would we build instead? And I want to, um, I'll put this in the chat now as the first opportunity. We're going to be putting materials in the chat throughout today. This is uh, just a wonderful piece that I thought would be good for us to start with today to share with you. Please save it. It's a it's a YouTube video. It's um, Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. Glaude is the uh, uh, professor of African-American studies at Princeton University, an extraordinary person. Um, and um, he's got a new his newest book, um, we are the leaders we have been looking for. And I want to use that to set the context for this conversation, uh, to begin that conversation about new institutions. And the new institution is to stop waiting. They're not coming. You know, no, no one's coming to give you justice or give me justice or give the folks I want to stand in solidarity with justice. We, we've got to be the leaders we've been looking for to create that justice. And part of that work is to imagine better institutions and to build bridges from where we have been to where we want to go. And, um, and so we really want to talk about that today. We wanted to set the context. Um, and uh, as Liz and I thought about that, given as, as fellows with, with the RSA, what we realized is it's we want to talk about that, but we aren't necessarily the right people to talk about that. There were there were people we could think of immediately who were better. And in fact, Liz and I made a list immediately and ended up with 10 people and then went to the R saying, you know, can we squeeze nine or 10 people into a, you know, an hour conversation? And they wisely reminded us that probably wouldn't work. And so um, so we had to look at our list again. And and to, quite frankly, it's although it's it's not a contest, it wasn't a hard decision out of the list that we had about who we would want to lead that conversation. And they're with us. Um, and it was Angela Burton and Sheldon Spotted Elk. And, um, and so our hope, Liz and my hope is to, um, to foster a conversation, but largely it's a conversation um, with Angela and a conversation with Sheldon. Um, I think, I think as a, 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 a white man of a particular age, learning to be quiet is a real challenge, um, but I'm working on it. And, um, and I'm going to keep working on it. And I, I hope where I make mistakes today, and I'm not quite as I should be, I hope you'll forgive me for that. But I am working on that because I recognize the problem of it. So anyway, I want to thank you. I want to welcome all of you. And um, I think uh, my I, I'd like to get started with a question for each of you, which is, I know we've got short bios and people have seen them, but but like I asked Elizabeth, if there was a particular way that you'd like to be known today to introduce yourself, would if you... I'd, ask if you could do that. Um, and maybe we could start with Angela. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Kevin has stopped talking. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Kevin. As, as, listen, it's always great to have um, something to be working on um, as we show up in these spaces together. Um, so how would I like to be? Okay, so as you can all see, I'm a Black woman. Um, I like to say that, um, you know, of a certain age, Kevin, also, I just had a birthday. Um, I just turned 64, um, actually. And um, so that means that I'm a child of the 60s in America, uh, United States of America. And um, I was born in 1960. So um, so I think, you know, just those couple of uh, and from from the south of, of the United States of America, uh, Mississippi, um, and, you know, kind of uh, migrated from Mississippi to New York, um, which is kind of a, a typical uh, way that that people kind of do that. Um, 
And so I think all of those experiences of having been raised in the South um, by a village, um, the village of Meridian, Mississippi, uh, with aunts and, and uncles and grandmas and pastors and church mo mothers and teachers and, uh, you know, just the neighborhood. Uh, and then moving to Brooklyn and, and Queens, New York, where um, it was different, but somewhat similar, you know, a little less connected, uh, a little less disconnected in terms of neighborhood feeling. Um, but I think those early experiences kind of um, are some of the defining uh, aspects of my life and how I enter the work that I do today. So I'll stop talking and pass it over to Sheldon. Yeah, what an honor to be here. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be able to join this conversation. Um, at Pivot Wona, uh, it's a good morning. It's a beautiful morning uh, in Cheyenne. Um, I am Northern Cheyenne from Lame Deer, Montana. Originally, I, I grew up in a, and I say border town, but it's border to the Indian reservation that in San Juan County, Utah. Um, and there was, a, and, I, and this definitely informs the way that I think about the world. And it was an incredibly racist place that I grew up in uh, that had some definitive challenges. Like you could look, it doesn't take very much research to kind of see all this. The Brown v. Board of Education in Indian country actually is in that school district that I went to. Uh, there's been gerrymandering lawsuits. There's been uh, civil rights lawsuits um, uh, in the last four years, you know. And so it's a it's an incredibly difficult place. And I think reflecting on that, I'm also a lawyer, um, and so I I get to serve on a tribal court of appeals as a as a judge. And so I think that definitely influenced the way that this conversation we're going to have about justice. Uh, has really def definitively influenced uh, my upbringing, definitively influenced that. I recently, and I'll, I'll just share, I, my, my mother passed away this last year. Um, and so, but before she passed, I was remember having a conversation with her about how many times we, my family was referred to the Child Welfare Agency. <laughs> and mind you, I was never spanked ever in my entire life. I was never even grounded. It probably tells you a lot about how unruly I am, but. Uh, I should have been, I probably should have been grounded a few times, but never spanked, never had anything like that ever. But we were a poor native family in this community and that resulted into four referrals to child welfare that came to our house. I could remember some of those and that, that's why I was asking, I was like, how many times did they come over actually? And so four times. Um, and so it was it was really a, a, an interesting childhood actually, now that I reflect on it, uh, way different than what my kids are being raised in. <laughs> so. Uh, that's who I am. Excited to join this conversation. Thank you, Sheldon. I think um, so. Admittedly, we've we've all uh, been talking about this in this group of four long before today. It's this is maybe a continuation of that conversation, which is really a gift. I think the the place we've been kind of compelled as a group to to maybe explore is something that Kevin touched on in the introduction, which is this misunderstanding about the things that we have to accept in order to imagine what is instead. Um, we we can't seem to do that, right? We can't seem to imagine a conversation about what what we do instead without assuming that all these institutions and structures that have historically existed have to come with. And so I think my first question to just pose to us to, to talk about, to the two of you to talk about is um, when you imagine leading those conversations as you both do and kind of exploring the idea of what we do instead um, and maybe assisting us, each of us individually as the leaders we've been looking for in exploring that without the assumption that all these institutions have to come with that package, um, what what does that strike up for you? How do you speak about that? What what comes to mind? Just I'd just love to hear you both talk a little bit about that, if you're willing. I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I think uh, that that's a good question, actually, and I so I'm thinking a lot about even our title of this this conversation here about justice and repair and restoration, like when we, I think of those things, I think there's sometimes a design issue. Um, and so, and I, I come from the ilk of that laws in America, in the United States of America, um, 
were created to to elevate white men and and disenfranchise black and brown people uh, and and create wealth um, for for certain people in our society. Um, and and on the back of that, this is what the system is 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 developed. You know, the system of removing black and brown children at disproportionate rates. Um, there's a times three disproportionality for indigenous children in the foster care system. Um, Canada is very similar. Um, actually, this month is uh, Orange Shirt Day. Uh, I believe that's next month, uh, next week. Um, and so, and it's recognizing the residential schools. And so I do think sometimes there's a design issue um, because our humanity, indigenous people's humanity and our connection to the land um, has been undermined explicitly in the United States for, for at least 200 years uh, by acts of Congress. Uh, the Indian Civil, Civil, Civilization Act uh, was passed in 1819 um, that really brought churches into our communities that were trying to civilize the savage, if you will, um, in, in our communities. And so on the back of all that, this is what the system is. And so I do think when I think about reimagining what the system might look like, and maybe I'm getting way too ahead of myself, but I think of, and Cheyenne actually, there's not a direct translation for the word justice in a lot of different languages. That's a white construct, it's a Western construct. And when we really kind of look at it, there's a mismatch sometimes is like justice and, and what, it, what it stands for. It doesn't necessarily uh, equate to a lot of people. Uh, the closest translation, because I asked my dad's first language is Cheyenne. I'm like, dad, how do you say justice? And he's like, oh, I'll get back to you. And so this is his first language, but it still took him a few days. He came back and he's like the closest. And it's a spiritual concept. It's a ceremonial concept. Esto menes is what the word is in, in Cheyenne. And it means connection. It means being, it's describing you in the middle of a circle and having connection with humanity and, and the land is what it's describing. Um, and so that's when you have justice is when you're, you're connected that way. Uh, and so you could think about the history of disconnection that uh, that governments have done to black and brown people. And so how do we how do we achieve that justice? You know, and I do think there's a lot of design approaches that prevent people from <laughs> even coming close to that. Um, and I'll maybe talk a little bit more about that. But the last thing I'll add, and I want to hear from Angela, is this. Um, in the United States, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978. Um, and if you read the congressional findings on that, uh, if you're if you're not from the United States, it was passed with a very specific context. And so at the time when it was passed, uh, there's congressional findings that show that one out of three Native children, if you think about these numbers here, one out of three Native children were removed from their home. And 90% of those kids that were removed from their home were placed with non-Native uh, families. And so really uh, forced assimilation 2.0, uh, past the boarding schools uh, and, and a really forcing us to be raised out of our communities, raised out of our culture, raised out of our families. Um, and so that is the, the way that ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed is to solve that problem. And so this is the only reparative law in the child welfare books. And, and I believe that I do a lot of work with that, that law, um, a lot of consultation with that law, a lot of training with that law. Uh, and I do believe in order to get that law right, we need to show up with that spirit. We need to show up with repair. Uh, we need to show up with with humanity and abundance mentality rather than a scarcity mentality. Um, and so if that law if that happens in a court of state state courts, uh, so it doesn't happen in tribal courts, happens in state courts. And so in order for non-natives to really uh, will work with native families and tribal communities, it needs to be in that sense of repair. Uh, if it's going to be done at all. Uh, and so I, I believe that's how we get that law right. So we have to have repair in our heart. Uh, I want to hear what Angela has to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you take, I, I was following, you know, your, your thought uh, process there, Sheldon. And um, I think I kind of maybe start in a different place because even though I'm also a lawyer um, and a lot of the work that I do um is around dismantling um, bad laws, CAPTA, um, Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act um, in, the, in the United States, which is marking its 50th year of devastation 
and destruction, uh, which created what we call the Child Protective Services or CPS system. Well, didn't create it, but codified it in, in federal law and national law and connected money um, from the feds to the states to implement um, the system which um, you know, has morphed into, at least in name, what we call child welfare or child protection, but is actually built on carceral principles of uh, mandated reporting, which is basically surveillance, um, investigation, prosecution, and these coerced um, quote unquote services. But where I start with the question, Liz, that you posed of how do we imagine or think about what we would do instead. And I really appreciate the opportunity to have this space to do that because I'm always out there fighting against and raging against the machine, um, is we don't have to imagine what we would do instead because we are already doing what we would do instead. We are already, in my community at least, um, and I use that term very broadly to encompass Black folks um, in the United States, we take care of each other. Um, we always have under all kinds of oppressive conditions um, in this country. And um, before that, in our own native lands um, where we came from, including here in the United States, Black people, um, as Indigenous people as well, um, and so we don't really have to imagine what that would look like. All we have to do is accept um, that that is what is already happening. Um, you know, as Sheldon mentioned, you know, in his uh, uh, childhood, uh, when uh, CPS came to uh, to their home, it wasn't because of some kind of uh, horrendous abuse. Um, or, you know, anything like that. It was because there may have been probably, I'm just assuming, but also based on the statistics that we have in the United States, um, over 70% and sometimes up to 90% in certain jurisdictions, CPS is coming into families' lives because of lack of resources, um, lack of childcare, lack of um, you know, adequate food, lack of, um, you know, just the basic necessities of life. And so we are already engaged in those things. Um, and I think for when we look at how do we flip out of this mindset, this ideology that government has to, that the protection that government provides to Black children, I'm just going to speak from my own perspective, is primarily about ripping them from their parents, from their families, from their communities, and placing, detaining in government custody somewhere else. Um, that's what we have to get out of the way of, right? And look at what is actually there. Like Kevin talked about, you know, uh, I had a recent um, situation where a young, uh, you know, I met a young young girl and, uh, you know, she was in foster care. She was in a congregate facility. And when I tried to find out what was really going on, um, the clerk of the court said that uh, her parents' rights had been terminated and she no longer had any parents, <laughs> which, you know, was just totally disgusting for me to hear, right? Um, this child's parents were alive and well, <laughs> still living in the community. So were her grandparents, her siblings and everyone else. But the law said that she had no parents and therefore she had no family. Therefore she had no body, uh, which was a complete lie. So I think that where I would start is we don't have to imagine that. We just have to accept that there are, um, children do have families and even if we look at a situation where there has actually been harm to a child from a parent or a family member, that should not mean that that child is no longer able to be connected with their entire village. Um, so that's where I would start. Um, Ed, I'm just thinking about part of the conversation we had the other day and Sheldon, you, you said this word also, scarcity and the, the lie of scarcity. And 
and how some of us get indoctrinated with there's not enough. And so you tend to isolate an other and I'm, I'm not speaking just about child welfare here, although there is a lie about scarcity of parents, <laughs> Angela, to your most recent story. And you said something really simple, but really striking. There's enough for everyone. And I just wondered if you'd go down that road a little bit more today, because I think for maybe some, some of us, that's um, a counter narrative to the one we've eaten. I'm not going to say been fed, but we've eaten over our life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, just kind of situating that question within the work that I do around trying to dismantle systems that interrupt, disrupt, and destroy um, families in the name of child welfare, child protection, et cetera. Um, when we look at the United States, for example, um, the most recent numbers indicate that um, every year about 33 billion, with a B, capital B, billions of dollars are spent in the name of child welfare and child protection. That's a lot of money. <laughs> like, you know, um, that's a lot of money. That could do a whole lot of good. Um, but when you look at how it's broken down, um, and if I think about it, I can I can uh, figure out the link to the graph that shows all the breakdown of where that money is spent. And that includes federal, you know, state and local. It also does not include all of the money spent by philanthropy. Um, you know, private foundations that also, you know, are are pouring into this um, into this system. Um, but so we start there, right? Um, and that when we just look at the thirty three billion, which is taxpayer money, right? Like that's money. That's the collective's money. And uh, that's being, that's one of the reasons why I'm always out here yelling and screaming to people like, your money is being spent. This is how your money is being spent. Did you know? Um, and so the majority of that $33 billion, whether you look at it from here or there or the other places, being spent on children being removed from their families, placed, detained somewhere else, whether it's with kin or whether it's with strangers or in these facilities, um, and the detriment to that um, is really is really uh, horrendous, right? And the outcomes for those children and the experiences um, are really horrendous. And so what we can think about is even without any new money, and although on the other hand, right, we can always print money, we do it all the time <laughs> if we wanted to, um, but there's enough already, right? There's enough already. And I think this, this is a theme that keeps coming up, right? As we're talking like, there's already, there's already, we don't actually have to be imagining all these new systems and the designs and this and that, right? Just be human. And think about humanity when we're making decisions, not only about laws and practices, but also about how we use our collective resources. Um, and so one of the things that my the group that I'm working with that I uh, founded and co-convened with uh, my co-conspirator, as she calls herself, Joyce McMillan, is a repeal CAPTA um, group, uh, work group. And that group has brought together academics, people with lived experience, teachers, nurses, doctors, et cetera. And what we're looking at is to, at least as a start, to say to our federal government, stop giving money to states for these horrendous practices of mandated reporting and investigations and prosecutions and these coerced services, so to speak, right? Take that money, put it into community-based, community-led, activities, initiatives, you know, support groups, whatever it is, because that is where the expertise, that is where the genius, that is where the humanity lies. We don't need to create systems. Systems is what's got us where we are now in trouble. And what we need to do is support humanity. What we need to do is support community. What we need to do is support the family. And what the, one of the biggest barriers to that is trust. People and I don't like to just say the government, but because it's, it's people, right? I was a government worker. And so for whatever reason, either they're predisposed or once they get there, some people start acting all brand new when they get in these government positions and start wanting to tell other people what they need to be doing and judging people and all this other kind of stuff, right? And so they don't trust 
the community or they don't trust the family to use the resources the way they should, right? And so my thing about that is just like, leave people the hell alone, give them the money. And I, I like to say from the black people's pers uh, perspective, give us our reparations and leave us the hell alone. Cause we know what to do. We know how to, how to, how to manage ourselves and we know how to support ourselves and we know what we need. We don't need someone else telling us um, what we need. So I will stop my rant now. Thank you. <laughs> I love your rants, Angela. Um, you, you mentioned something that again, came up in our conversation the other day. And I, the word that always comes to mind for me is, is remembering, although I'm not sure it's remembering if it's happening right now in Maybe it is. Maybe you remember every day. This is how we take care of each other. This is how to be human. Um, and that led us down of really of the beginnings, at least of a path about, um, I think you called it futurity, Shelton, um, and just connecting back to or continuing to connect, depending on the community you find yourself in membership with, to the values and um you mentioned something about just kind of returning back into those things as the way to be human, the way to connect and live life and take care of one another. Um, so I just wondered if we could go more down the, the rabbit hole of that language with you a little bit. Yeah, I think I, I just recently read about uh, indigenous futurities as, as the term right there. And some academics are exploring that. And, but I think a lot of people are living it. You know, you don't have, you have to be in an ivory tower to live that. Um, so. Um, and it really is about, uh, it is a magic wand kind of question. What is, what is the future of indigenous peoples look like in 50 years, you know? Um, and I think that is a powerful question. I, I think of my own community, you know, how many, like, what are the issues that we're, we're addressing in those times? I, I like to think of it in a straight space way, but of course there's big problems that our community is facing too. So uh, in 50 years, how many kids are going to be in foster care, you know, in our community? Hope that answer zero. You know, I hope, hope the system, and I do believe that the system in 50 years or less, um, we're going to look at what we're doing right now and be ashamed. We're going to be embarrassed about what, what we did uh, with this legal fiction, you know, and so Angela talks about this legal fiction of termination of parental rights, you know, so um, parents could be living <laughs> and you could, re you could even change birth certificates. You could reassign a child to another uh another family, you know, so this is a legal fiction, you know, and so there's a lot of legal fictions that are within all law, <laughs> but especially child welfare. And I do think that's what it's about is I think storytelling is a big power, part of it. I do say we need to be artists. Uh, we need to be artists of living. We need to be artists of humanity. Um, you could paint a picture and sing a song. That's also cool. Uh, but, but really fundamentally being an artist uh, of living and, and of our humanity any society that we're in, this group right here that we're on right now, you know, we tell stories about who we are and how we show up in space. You know, we kind of went over some ground rules before we even started, you know. There's stories about what we tell are like, this is what we stand for. These are the principles that we stand for when it comes to humanity. Um, I do think those are the fundamental things that we need to really address because there are, and there's, I'm punching way above my weight now, but just like there are uh, researchers that have written about uh, what is this existential anxiety of why a group of people will colonize vast areas, you know, for wealth? You know, what is that about them? That they will kill somebody, you know, they will they will murder another individual uh, in order to gain wealth, um, in order to colonize. Um, so there's a psychology that's connected to there. Ernest Becker, I was kind of like Ernest Becker's denial of death. I feel like he kind of starts addressing some of those uh, those ideas when it comes to scarcity and abundance and and some of the mentality that comes with, I need to, to kill you in order to take your land so I could be wealthy and I could preserve my legacy way paths beyond I die, when I die, you know? So like, uh, and even still your kids, I'm gonna take your kids eventually, you know? And so this whole sequence of colonization, of, of interaction, of, uh, of derogating. So I'm gonna derogate your humanity. I'm gonna say, hey, you're less than me. <laughs> uh, assimilate, um, appropriate. And so I'm going to even steal stuff that you're doing and say it's mine now. Uh, and so I'm going to steal some of those concepts. But eventually all this leads to genocide um, is, is the way that, that that's framed. And so that's, like I said, I'm punching way above my weight. But I, but I think there's some of these concepts are out there that 
why, why are we doing this? You know, you scratch your head. Why are, why is this happening into vast amount of communities? And if you go down the hole, it, it's always race, it's racism actually. And so if you ask that question, why is there times three uh, disproportionate uh, native kids in the in foster care? We could make all these connections. It's this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. And eventually you have to hold a belief. If you're believing that, that's correct. We sh there should be times three native children in the foster care. The very core of that is the racist belief that somehow native families are unable to take care of their children um, because they're native. They're native. And I think that's one of the biggest memes. Uh, and I, I use meme in the broadest sense of memetics. Uh, the very core of what that means is ideas that go viral that tell a story in our society. And, and there's a lot of these the lies that have gone viral, these memes, these memetics that have gone viral. And, and that's what a significant one. Um, and so how do we get rid of that? And I, I think that's an exciting thought for me is like, what's the stories that we tell in 50 years? What's the way that we look at our humanity? What, how do we, how do we show up in the world, you know, as Cheyenne people, you know, or, or whatever group of people you're talking about, how do we show up in the world, uh, in your community, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's an exciting thing for us. I, I think it's exciting for me is how the humanity show up in that way. I like that somebody, uh, oh, Kevin, just put doctrine of discovery. That's also a great big lie. You know, this is a great, one of the greatest lies in our legal system. And you might ask yourself, like, how this vast continent of the United States and Canada, and Canada has a very similar doctrine, actually. How did that happen? How did Indian people... How, how do we don't have ownership? How do we not have full fee simple <laughs> title to this land? You know, and so this it happens right at the very beginning. Um, at, at the very, the, there used to be a last point that I'll make is, is there it all origi originates from the Catholic Church. They would issue these popple bowls, um, but even when uh, Europeans would come on the land of the United States. They had something called the requirement or, or the requirmento that they would read. They'd read it in Spanish to native people that didn't speak Spanish. Sometimes they'd even read it to the ground or a tree. <laughs> and there's a psychological dynamic there that allows you to become not human. And, and really the fundamental premise of the doctrine of discovery is that indigenous people are not human and can't, can't hold title, full title to, to land. We can't have the ability to transfer title. Um, it's really what the, the case that really flushes that all out, uh, but really undermining our humanity. And so this little prayer that they would read could help them turn off their conscience. And I think there's a lot of things that we could say. And when we say something is legal, that has a powerful effect on us. It has a powerful effect on, on us. You know, when I say, oh, that's legal. You could do a lot of terrible, inhumane things. Yeah. And be legal. Yeah. And, and if if I if I could just jump in, I wanted to pick up on you know Sheldon, where you kind of brought us back to you know sort of the humanity, the psychology, um, conscious conscience, and all those things. Um, so as we're kind of trying to think about how we move from where we are with these embedded memories, I'll call them. I, I learned that term from just reading some random thing about systems analysis or whatever, right? Like, cause I'm always trying to figure myself out like what is the system and why is it operating all these things? So embedded memory, right? And and that to me is one of the ways that this current system has um, uh, brainwashed us basically to think about, um, you know, how we engage as government and with other people people othered, I would say. Um, and so, you know, going back to like this CAPTA thing, um, CPS, we call it child welfare, and when we know it really isn't. Um, how do we move, how do we get people off that dime? And so one of the things that I'm finding really exciting about the work that uh, I'm doing with this group in New York City called Narrowing the Front Door, um, it's, narrow, it's a very long name, <laughs> narrowing the front door to New York City's child welfare system work group. We have a website. Um, and that group uh, came together. And at this point, we have, you know, people with lived experience, we have academics, um, we have the form of, it first started as th with three co-chairs. I was one of the co-chairs and the two other co-chairs are now the commissioner 
of New York City's Child Welfare, Child Protective Services Agency, and the Deputy uh, Mayor for Human Services. Right? And so we started as this group to kind of bring community together, and then they got appointed to these government positions. And so we're still able to maintain, you know, dialogue and about how the cities, how the government mechanisms are impacting families. Um, but so recently we um, have been having this public conversation with the heads of three of the largest foster care contract agencies in New York City about their movement from understanding the negative and detrimental impact that they've had on the communities that they claim to serve. Um, and we, they're calling it the reckoning. Um, and so I think that one of the precepts of kind of moving from where we are now is really about engaging in those really deep uh, conversations that connect these bad practices with our humanity. And so that people will start to be convicted by being confronted with the harms that they've been perpetuating and perpetrating in the name of, I'm just doing my job, or I've got to check this box off. Um, I don't have enough time because I got all these other things, or I got too many people or too many kids on my docket, you know, whether it's a lawyer or a caseworker or this or that. Um, and so having these conversations, not just in private, because that's what we're also hearing, right? A lot of the frontline workers, um, you know, are like, we've been saying this for a long time. We're so glad that it's finally like out in the open and out in the public. We don't wanna do these things. We know it's hurting the children. We know it's hurting the families. Why are we ripping children away from their, um, you know, their, their bloodlines, right? Why are we ripping them from their communities? Why are we isolating them? And then uh, setting up these quote unquote visitation or parenting times, which is, you know, one hour every other week in some office somewhere. Like we don't want to do that. And we're just so glad that we're finally being able to have this conversation out in public. Right. And so, you know, as we were preparing for this session, that, that, that phrase, I think is attributed to Cornell West kept coming up in my mind, like, justice is what love looks like in public, right? And so um, I think pushing these public conversations, um, you know, really highlighting the, the harms that are being per perpetuated in the name of, you know, child welfare or family engagement, family team conferences. I've been to those. They are not teams and they're, and they're, they're not helpful. Um, but yeah, so when we start to look at um, the actual practices that happen between people um, and think about our humanity and have those conversations in public. I think we give people the courage. Uh, we inspire people to uh, act differently and we unsettle those embedded memories, those mimetics, those lies that we've been operating on for so long. And that's what opens up our opportunities to love one another and to, to, and to be kind and to not and to stop and think about in the moment, is this the decision? Is this decision, when I make this decision, am I supporting the system or am I supporting this family, this child, this parent, this mom, this dad, um, that's right here with me, so, yeah. Um, Angela, could I ask you a question? Just following up, um, you, if I could go back just a little bit and what you were saying, if, you know, um, that that question why why are we separating and i wanted to react but to that by saying we've given people an answer to that question we are separating because of addiction we are separating because of neglect we are separating because of something that we bought into this idea can you can you comment or either of you comment on going deeper than than that question that you know we are separating because of of addiction let's use that what's the deeper question then we're separating because of addiction right yeah and i think it kind of goes back to what sheldon was talking about right like all of these uh answers as to why we separate why we remove why we take children why we disrupt families um 
and then uh, assigning these uh, rationales, right? Uh, it's because there's addiction and therefore we fear that this child will be harmed because this mom, mainly, usually, um, will not be able to care for them properly. So we have to detain this child in government custody and pay somebody else to, you know, manage and control the child while mom gets her act together with no resources, no support. Uh, all the things that we throw at them to um, do in order to get their act together. Um, from our, my perspective as a Black woman, why we separate is because it is a practice that was profitable in slavery. And we've continued to morph that practice of separation into various and sundry policies like mass incarceration, like criminalizing just being, like, you know, like child welfare and child protection. So I think why it, the question isn't really why we separate, um, because I think we 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 kind of know why we separate. It is what is the impact, what is the outcome, and how do we um, help people to understand um, to not do that? <laughs> um, and so I, I you know kind of bring it back to to the to the slavery or enslavement experience. Um, I was just reading. I'm just starting to read a book called A, a, a Price for Their Pound of Flesh. Um, by her last name is Barry. Oh my goodness, I should have brought that with me. I'll, I'll get it before we leave. Um, but she talks about the um, the valuation, not not the value, but the valuation of putting a a price on enslaved people's um, life from 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 pre birth to death and even after death. Um, so. Uh, black people in this country have been um, reframed as commodities. Um, so Sheldon talked about, you know, native indigenous people, you know, they're not human, they're some other creature. Um, black people were really um, framed and, and identified and defined as commodities. And our children are continuing to be used as commodities in this system. So um, what we're having to do is reclaim our humanity. Um, and and really working through this neo slavery that we're we're in, I think again having these public conversations, being able to really talk frankly about slavery, enslavement, profit, commodification, um, you know, uh, the the true reality of, of of buying and selling children, sex trafficking, all, you know, the 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 industry. The, you know, people say foster care. It's an industry, right? Like there's all of these different institutions that are built up around taking control and management and custody of other people's children and getting paid to do that and getting paid to oversee, um, like on the plantation and manage the families and um, to also, what is the word I uh, heard? Uh, reconfigure families, right? But the money is all on that side, as opposed to money and resources being in supporting families in their natural state. Yeah, Jess Dahlhauser, didn't he mention reconfiguring the other day? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, I'll jump in and yeah, add. Please, please show them. Um, so about 70% of the kids that are in foster care are removed from their home because of neglect reasons. So it's not abuse, not sexual abuse, not physical abuse. Uh, but what court systems have made rulings on and saying, hey, this is neglect, uh, primarily because of uh, what you're you're talking about abuse and I mean uh, because of uh, uh, addiction issues. Uh, and so when we look at that, and, and, I, and I'm doing this really super conservative, uh, just for y'all. Um, and so these these are not my exact feelings, but if we look at is removing kids an evidence-based treatment for those issues. Is this making their lives better? We have a lot of evidence that says it makes their lives worse, actually. Uh, there's a researcher out of MIT, last name Doyle, that did some research on this, and they they looked at these kids that are on the margins, you know, as they say in, the, in this article, on the margins, you know. Uh, should we remove or not remove? They have an assessment that they do with both kids, and they look at where they're at in a, couple, a few months from then. Uh, kids that are in foster care wage way worse. If you age out of foster care, uh, statistically, you're going to have some really difficult dynamics that you're going to have to overcome. We know this statistically. 
So why are we using this as the intervention if we know definitively that it's a terrible intervention, you know, so that we don't have something that's evidence-based <laughs> with all the obsession that I think sometimes the, the federal government in the United States has around we need, in order to provide treatment funding to whatever uh, treatment there is, it needs to be quote unquote evidence-based. The whole premise of, of this system, the $33 billion that's going out the door is not evidence-based. Um, the other thing I would add with this is there is a need, I saw somebody talk about restorative justice uh, resources there. And when we start thinking about, this is why I think there's a design issue here. You know, when we start thinking about our Western justice system is really obsessed with, with primary justice, you know? So if, uh, if I got something, <laughs> well, even in a lot of instances, we don't, we don't get it correct actually. And so if I'm filing a lawsuit because I got injured in a car accident, you know, they're trying to replace, they're trying to restore my injuries, you know, they're trying to restore what my injuries were and that, but there's all these secondary things, especially these issues that have to do with families and children and communities, these secondary harms that are, are created. And we think about access to housing historically in the United States. We think about access to healthcare in the United States. We, we think about access to education, all these things that have been, our communities have been disenfranchised from and, and, and there's still no really direct approaches to how do we resolve some of those things. Uh, I think a lot of times that I used to represent children, a lot of times that I would always notice is that there's so many other systems that failed this family before they ended up in court, you know, like uh, they've been denied social security disability access, you know, they've been denied housing, they've been denied employment. So there's all these different systems that really failed that these families that put them in these situations. And now the, res the resolve is that the system is going to remove their children, like, I, it, and it's not evidence-based. There, there, I have a lot of frustration about that. And I, I do think there's some design things that we could put into place that go upstream, so to speak, uh, that narrow that front door. And that radically changes how many kids go into foster care tomorrow. Uh, Just a quick um, support of that um, from Liz and I were involved in a, uh, what we called a uh, process called truth telling in child welfare and a project we called together in truth and it was a group of uh, african-american parents in washington dc in the district who came together and constructed a truth-telling process around their experiences with child welfare and to the point you make sheldon they sold out what they said to us uh, as they um you know had really come together and confronted their experiences is they said that um they what they said about ch child welfare was child welfare didn't do this to us they said they said every welfare department in the district each of them hammered us they said and then they went on to say child welfare finished us off um and what they were saying was the issue they faced were an all of government experience not a particular agency that is not to excuse the agency to finish them off but it is to broaden as you've just suggested that that uh, as we as we confront these issues of of what institutions we want to carry forward we recognize um that child welfare is one of those institutions it is not the only one as, as and I, I i speak not as so i i just want to reflect their wisdom because it was profoundly important wisdom uh, from people with direct experience um thank you yeah can, can I just jump in? Um, I'm kind of scrolling the chat as well. And uh, there's, um, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. Um, Shije Sakurai asked a really good question about do the panelists have favorite resources, communities, publications that help folks to move the work in material and practice oriented ways? And I think that's the wrong question or the question is being directed outwardly and the question really should be directly in inwardly because here's why I'm saying that right we are all in different spaces in different communities in different jurisdictions we have different um, all the people on this call have different relationships in community some people I saw signed in work for local de de department of social services some people seem to be working with are involved with uh, community organizations right and so I think that when you talk about resources, um, the resources are in your community. The resources are the people 
who are being impacted by all of these government systems, by all of these various programs and services. That is where the answer lies. I'm, I can't give you an answer to, or anyone an answer to, you know, what should happen in your jurisdiction. Um, one of the things that the Narrow in the Front Door group is also working on is what we're calling an accountability council. And again, even though I have been sort of the prime, you know, uh, mover and writer and researcher on that project, that idea came from the community when we did several convenings, public convenings, they were all on online, and we asked people what would be um, you know, recommendations that we could make as this narrow in the front door group that would help us move from where we are to where we want to be. There were many, many great recommendations. You can see a lot of them in the uh, report and community recommendations that I put in the chat from the narrow in the front door group. And one of those recommendations was an accountability council. What that accountability council would look like is a convening of community people um, led by people who've been impacted primarily because it's um, about child protective services by the child welfare system, um, but with other people, you know, involved as well, but led by those people who have been impacted the most. Um, and that group would come together to hold government officials accountable for not only ending harmful practices that the community itself identifies, but also putting in place funding mechanisms, putting in place resources in community that those communities themselves actually decide and, and work with government to make happen. Another project that we're working on in New York State at the state level is what we're calling the Child and Family Wellbeing Fund, which would currently, you know, any money that comes from the feds or from the state around child protection or child welfare usually goes through the state social services agency, which is the prosecuting agency, right, to be clear. And then it flows through to local departments of social services or community organizations that contract with that agency. And so what we're trying to do is free up some money out of the state coffers to go directly to community-led, community-based initiatives. They don't have to be an organization that are grounded in the community, connected with the community, and knows what the community wants because they are part of the community. So there are a lot of things that we, and many other people, you know, you mentioned DC, um, you know, Melody Webb and her group of moms um, who are working to bring, um, uh, you know, cash, uh, direct cash assistance um, to people. So there are a lot of things that are already going on and what we're, hoping to do is move those levers within government to open up those funding streams to support those community-led, family-led initiatives and, and, and programs and, and organizations. It's a resource problem or not even a problem, it's a resource question of how we open up the, our collective resources to support communities and families and take that money out of systems that we already know, as Sheldon said, has been so detrimental and continue to be detrimental to families and family life. Can I jump in really quick and add on Please. that? Um, I, I, when you start thinking about systems change, and I, I don't know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this actually. And so we start thinking about the, the technical things that need to change. Uh, and so some of this is a policy law and you could kind of think about your own job or your own things that you're doing every day. If you had a boss, or a spouse or somebody come to you and say, hey, I need you to check off these five things every day in your job. And they gave you a checklist. And so you had to, that would cha probably change the way you do your job in some ways. It might make you upset. It might say, do you know, they don't understand my job. Why are they giving me these five things to do? But that would change in some ways, but that's just the surface level. Um, what we want to eventually get to as far as systems change is what we're talking about is storytelling, you know? And so for us to, more than just resources, you know, more than just articles and research, um, that actually only lasts a little bit, you know, reading a MIT researcher, you could be like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. All right, go back to my work, you know, uh, because the way that we do our work or the way that we think about people or the way that we think about families sometimes is really based upon these mental models that we've developed 
around what's good and what's bad, what's safe and unsafe. <laughs> and so at the very core of this, you know, that is what we're trying to get, these adaptive things. So change happens with tactical and adaptive uh, components of this. And really, when I start thinking about, it's important for us to tell our truths. I, I, I think th that's important. Uh, we need everybody to tell their truth. Um, and, I, and I feel like this is a lot of the movements, great movements that Angela is part of, are based out of lived experience, based out of people that have not studied this and thought deep thoughts about it or written articles about it, uh, but have lived it and saying, here's how I want my humanity to be seen. Here's how my humanity was not seen and really getting towards those mental models. And so truth telling always comes before reconciliation. Of course, we need more truth telling. We need more courage. I don't really know what that word means, you know, core with heart. We need to do, we need things with, with heart, you know, and so eventually to change those stories that we were telling. I think that's the big narrative change that comes uh, when, 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 we, when we show up in 50 years when the system's way different. I, I say 50 years, hopefully it's sooner than that. Uh, but, but, I, but that's what we need is we need those, those truths. The resources, the human resources that we have on this call uh, is the way we do collective action. I couldn't help but think of 50 years and 50 days, Sheldon, just in the context of where we find ourselves. Um, I just, I just want to go back to something Angela said, and then I know we've got some questions and would welcome folks who haven't typed them to just ask them in a minute. But you, you talk, Sheldon, about what stories we are telling. And I think the other thing that was one of the first things I ever remember learning from Angela, also questioning the stories you are told. Where did they come from? What is their function? Um, and one of them that I just keep thinking about over and over again in the context of different types of change is the people in these systems are often elected there, um, which means they work for us, not the other way around. And so I'm just back to your billion with a B tax dollars, Angela, and in theory, we could be saying, no, this is not how I want you to spend my money. And if you're not going to do that, then you don't have my vote, right? And I, I'm no civics expert by any means. I think that whole thing makes no sense a lot of the time, but that one I get. Um, and I'm just, I'm just really deeply connecting back to something practical as we're talking about um, justice is a verb. It's something you do um, and maybe one simple practical way to do that. Um, so just, I just had to, I felt like really compelled to say that aloud, given the, the state of things and we, 50 years would be good, Sheldon. And in 50 days, we'll be having one of many scary conversations. Yeah, I do. Yeah, on a, on a, again, going back to the practical, which, you know, uh, I think it was, uh, Marla Martinez who agreed with, um, uh, the other person about what is the, what are some practical things? So going back to this uh, conversation that we're that the narrowing the front door group is having in public with the CEOs of these foster care agencies, um, the next one is coming up next week. I think it's the twenty seventh. Um, so we can send that information if anyone wants to participate in that. Um, the next one will involve not only the CEOs on stage in public in front of an uh, audience of diverse people, but also staff members, people who are in various positions within the organization to talk about the internal process that these agencies are going through to reckon with their role over all these many decades in destroying families that they claim to be helping. Um, one of the things that we are also looking at and that you if you're if you're working for a department of social services or if you're working for an agency that contracts um, to provide preventive services or foster care services or adoptive services or whatever it is here's something you can do right go and get whatever uh contract or policy manual or guidance or directive that you are operating on, that you may have been trained on for a week or a day or two days or whatever, and then just thrown into the job, here's what you do, whatever, right? You, what we've started to do is we're looking at those contracts, we're looking at those policies, and we're pointing out where in those contracts, where in those policies, 
these harmful practices are coming from and interrogating those policies, interrogating the practices, looking at, oftentimes we'll have conversations with government officials and they'll be like, uh, or, or, or caseworkers or whatever, and they'll be like, well, we do it because X. And I'm like, is that a law? Is that a policy? Is that a rule? Or is that just a practice? And most of the time they have no idea. It's just the way we do it. And I think it's important to know if we're talking about change and we want to move into something more practice and, and material oriented, you have to start where you are in understanding the water that you're swimming in, right? Um, it's infested with sharks, by the way. <laughs> and, and no matter what we do, if we don't get the sharks out of the way, we're still running around in shark infested water. But, um, you know, it all comes back to for me, for example, when I started to look at the Child Abuse Protection and Treatment Act of 1974, because I was wondering to myself, I was like, I'm a lawyer. Why are we doing this in court? Like, what? why are we bring? why are we, why is there a court system where a government agency can petition to bring, to charge a family, to charge a parent with something called neglect or abuse and just say all kinds of things? Like, where did that even come? from <laughs> right so in my mind i had to go and figure out like where wh who made this up and why and so in order to figure out how to move forward we have to see where we are and a practical step that each and every one of us can take in whatever role we are wherever we're situated is go back and look at you know why do we do things this way where's this coming from is it just a practice is it something that's convenient um, and I'll give one more example and I'll stop talking. Um, one of the things when we did this whole uh, narrowing the front door for convenings for community input um, was that we heard from um, parents and children that, you know, once they're assigned to a foster care agency, it the, the, the visitation, which we know, maintaining those connections when children are separated is one of the main indicators of how fast and how safe and how prolonged, uh, uh, effective reunification will be, right? If reunification ever happens. And they were just like, this is crazy. We're not getting our visits. They cancel our visits, X, Y, and Z. So I dug a little deeper and all of you probably already know this, but foster agencies were being paid on a daily basis for having children in their care. Once the children were reunited, they didn't get paid anymore. So it seemed to be, you know, practice has fallen into keeping children in on the docket or on the ledger, I would say, going back to the price for their pound of flesh, right? On the ledger for as long as possible. And there was no incentive and remains to be no incentive for reunification. And so starting to look at that, we were like, hello, local department of social services, this is an incentive for people not to reunite children. Um, so what can we do about that? So again, just, just a couple of points about, you know, taking matters into our own hands, really looking at the context in which we're doing whatever it is we're doing and interrogating the premises, um, the ideology, um, the impact, um, aside from intent, everybody's got good intent. I agree. Okay. But the impact of what we're doing on the people that we're claiming to help. I, I just, there was something I'd intend to bring up earlier and, and I want to not miss the opportunity because we have the two of you here. Um, and that is, um, as I thought about, especially after we met the other day, I thought about joining with you today. I thought about the, um, the um you know the 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 you know kind of the, the struggle we seem to continue to have is to is the um what i've what i think of as as the challenge and opportunity we have is to expand our imagination our imagination for for what is true and um and i think one of the things we i suspect if you are in this if you're joining this or if you're watching it later we're we're probably connected somehow meaning we we come to this because we we think about what justice is we think about and work towards some kind of vision for a better justice and opportunity i think what we often face individually and even and even collectively is feeling less than powerful feeling less than 
equipped to face the problems that we have to face. And we can feel very alone in that and very, very isolated. I, after we met the other day with um, Sheldon and Angela, I was really inspired by listening to them and, and my imagination shifted a little bit and I, I didn't want to miss this. And there were two parts to it. One we talked about, which is um, Sheldon spoke earlier to, about colonization and one of our colleagues from the National Indian Child Welfare Association, the fa former founder there, or founder there, um, speaks of the five pillars of colonization. Um, the third or fourth one, he described as the denial of thought, the denial of worldview. If it's not white and European, it's not true, or it's at least not as valuable as what is white and European. So we find our our imagination for justice sometimes is is har is is limited to what we've been taught is valid versus what is invalid. Liz and I are working with a colleague in Australia on writing a paper um, that that it has a working title that that lived. Um, lived experience is evidence. And in that conversation, we are writing about 20 different forms of evidence that exist in the law. And yet in this industry, we only point to one valid kind of, of evidence, the evidence that comes from the academy. If the researcher from the university says it's true, it is true. Otherwise, no one else, is, no one else has a higher claim on evidence. We're arguing that you can send, you know, if someone robs a bank, and they run out the door with money in their hand and a, and a weapon in their hand and three people saw them and they're going to call them as witnesses. That evidence is enough to put that person in prison. They don't have to have gone to a university to be listened to. Um, we're arguing that that part of the challenge we have in our imagination to expand this is we've got to expand our definition of what evidence is and who writes it and how evidence is legitimate or is not. And so we're doing that in an article with them. Um, with a colleague in Australia to talk about that. But I just wanted to, to bring an example of expanding our imagination quickly. Um, and I'm gonna put it in the chat if you, you probably have heard of this, but they're what we call the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I just wanted to read you the, the first um, five of them so that if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling at times isolated about this, this fight for justice and the possibilities, this is a reminder to me at least, and I hope to you that you are not, you are far from being alone. Um, we've What we've got is not a, a lack of imagination for what justice is. We seem to institutionally have a, uh, have not discovered how to get to it. Not that we, we can imagine it, we just don't seem to be able to get there. And wh th what struck me is um, Sheldon, when we met before and today, spoke about uh, um, Cheyenne values. And the first value, Sh Sheldon, you mentioned, I'm, I know there are more than one, is nobody goes without. And uh, Angela spoke again today, there's enough for everyone. So let me read you the first number, the first UN Sustainable Development Goal, by the way, these were unanimously voted on and accepted, and they've set a goal of 2030 to achieve it, which of course we won't happen. But this is uh, all 129 UN nations voted for this. Here's the first goal, no poverty. Every government on the planet said in 2015 and voted unanimously that they held a, a, a vision that the first and most important thing that should happen on planet earth on planet Earth by 2030 is there be no poverty. Number two, there be zero hunger. Number three, good health and well-being. Number four, that we offer universally a quality education to every person. Number five, gender equality. There are 17 of these. Um, let me mention in terms of detail, 17 goals, 169 targets. 300 or 3,968 events, 1,351 publications, 7,865 actions. These people deeply thought about this in our names. But you would think it, that it doesn't exist because instead, I apologize for being topical, what we've got to talk about is the lie that there are people eating people's pets. That's That's the thing everybody's breathless about. But the truth is we're not alone in this vision for justice, this move for justice. Even our every member nation voted unanimously to say no poverty by 2030. There's enough for everyone. No one should go without. Um, th this, this truth is with us, but we 
we I would just argue, I guess I'm I'm rambling here. I'll just finish the point. The point is that um when I was thinking about this and about this concept of can what kind of institutions do we build instead? The first thought I had is what you need to build new institutions is you have to expand your imagination and, and your imagination for justice. And that imagination, um, it, part of expanding it is seeing, seeing the world more completely. Um, we're being sold a story in this election cycle about what matters and what doesn't, but it's not the only story. Um, and because there are many stories. Uh, and I think individually, we're called to remember that. I'm sorry. Thank you, Angela. And and yeah, Kevin, we're you. also be, being told stories about how money can be spent. Right. right? You know, um, going back to the sort of legal structure of the United States, um, you know, CPS family policing system. I should have said that from the top family policing system. Um, just as an example for ever since the time of Social Security Act, um, local departments of social services um, were able to uh, get reimbursement from Social Security Act Title IV-E funds, right, which is an uncapped entitlement and federal funds, funds flow in to support all of these quote-unquote child welfare um, activities. Lawyers who were representing or working in those agencies, those agencies were able to get reimbursement for some uh, uh, part of their salaries or their costs uh, for that legal representation for the agency. Fast forward to maybe three years ago now, with one little change in the policy manual, not even a law was had to change to do this, the former commissioner of the Children's Bureau said, hey, not only can agency attorneys salaries and costs and expenses be reimbursed in a certain amount by the federal government, but also independent legal representation of parents and children who are involved in child welfare system proceedings. They, the, their salaries and costs and expenses can also be reimbursed partially by the federal government. So it, again, it's not even only just a lack of imagination about resources, right? It's, it's also the lies that are told about how the resources can be spent. If you created this rule that lawyers for agencies can be reimbursed and left out these other people, you can change that. It, it can be changed. Nothing is set in stone, right? Like so. So the, I think part of the imagination question is not only the boxes that we're not only what can be, but also what we're told about what cannot be. And so I again always go back to interrogate the premises. Like, oh, we can't do that, really? Why? <laughs> You're doing this, so why can't we do that? <laughs> so yeah. Thank you so much, um, Angela. Um, I just. We've been having such a lively conversation and I know we've had several questions come through the chat. We just have a few minutes left, but I wanted to make sure that those folks had an opportunity um, to get some, some responses. And I know we've been answering a lot of those questions as we've been going. So thank you all so much for, um, for doing that so wonderfully. Um, but um, I know Shige had another question um, just around the accountability council um, that the narrowing the front door report suggests exists, um, or is it mainly a recommendation at this point? Angela, I saw you responded to that a little bit, but just wanted to provide some space if there was um, anything else you wanted to share around that. Yeah, so we were exchanging emails and we'll be in conversation, hopefully, because it seems that Shige is also um, involved in trying to do something like that. But yeah, we've elevated it to, so in New York City, there's been a uh, commission on racial equity, um, which has also been doing some community work to get some recommendations about how to reduce racial discrimination in um, government. And so we've been able to get this accountability council into that conversation. And we're looking at how to operationalize it um, with government officials. Um, and hopefully we can get something done in the next few months to really get that um, on, on, on track uh, where people are paid for their work, where there's um, uh, uh, um, 
information sharing from the government, transparency in data, um, and you know, public uh, ongoing public conversation. So yeah, we're we're very excited actually about that um, aspect of the recommendations that came out of our community um, engagement. Thanks so much, Angela. Um, and I think. Is that it? I don't see any other questions that we pulled from the chat, but if there was anything I, I missed, please flag for me. I think I think this one just came to me right at the beginning, but it's for you, Sheldon. And the, I'm, I apologize because I'm reading my notes, not the actual question. But the question was you had you had talked about um, that there's not translations for some of these things that we're trying to work at now, right? It's they're like sort of Western or English distilled down ideas sometimes maybe or a lot um and so the question was what is so difficult about translating remembering from certain communities into communities that are part of being oppressors <laughs> which is a really big question for two minutes just admittedly but it's a great question i think yeah i, I do think that's a tough question to, uh just still in two minutes. Um, geez, I, I I was thinking about what are what are some of the take homes that I I'd want the audience here to to do. And I I think if I were to do a call to action that's connected to your question that I hear, the call to action is I I think we we begin the process of remembering uh, by looking ourselves in the mirror. I, I believe that's where it starts. Um, and, and I believe that I believe you need to look yourself in the mirror with compassion. You need to look yourself in the mirror with forgiveness. Uh. And I, and I say that because your self-compassion actually could radiate to give compassion. And so you need to see your own inherent humanity that you have uh, in, in order to, to remember. And I, and I think that's the, the way we approach this. I do believe like Angela, I think the legal system, the Western legal system, I used to have a law professor that would always say, this was the great, you would say it sarcastically, the greatest engine for finding truth ever created by man. <laughs> We're asking the wrong questions uh, when families come before us in, in the system, they're asking the wrong questions altogether. Uh, and the rights dynamic around this sometimes is the wrong framing, the adversarial nature of the of, of what the legal system does. We're, we're framing uh, these questions in the wrong way and we're forcing families uh, to be oppressed by the greatest disenfranchisement machine that humans ever created. Uh, and so how do we really show up with full humanity and I believe it starts with you, actually. And so you understanding your bias, understanding how your your constructs have led you to where you're at right now. Um, and I, I think that's where it starts. Thank you so much, Sheldon. And thank you, Angela. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you all who joined us today. I know we're at time. Um, so we just want to thank you all, honor all of your time. I've got a short little spiel I'm going to give here at the end, but if you need to jump, we totally understand that. This is mostly just for those who are going to be watching the recording. Um, but um, if you do want to become a fellow, learn more about RSA Fellowship, um, please visit our website, um, learn more about what it means to be involved in this amazing, vibrant community. We will also have space on Circle, which is the RSA's online community, where you can go and continue this conversation, continue to learn about this topic, continue to share about it. Um, and again, just want to thank you all so much for sharing so many insightful um, provocative, exciting, but also incredibly grounded and at the same time, simple, um, very human um, ways of being and experiencing this. And so thank you all so much for your time, your expertise, your talent, um, and your heart. We greatly appreciate all of you um, and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye all, take care.